Griffith University is a Gold Coast institution and continues to grow. Its dynamic urban campus blending seamlessly into the region's world-class attractions. And now, partnering with the Gold Coast's cultural leader, Hotter Home of the Arts, we're proud to present our signature thought leadership and conversation series, helmed by master interviewer Kerry O'Brien. Welcome to A Better Future for All. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name's Carolyn Evans. I'm the Vice Chancellor and President of Griffith University, the co-host of this event, along with Hotter Home of the Arts here on the beautiful Gold Coast. Can I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, the Kumba Mary and the Yugambeh people, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and to all Tap Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Could I also acknowledge councillors of the City of Gold Coast, Mr. Mark Hamill and Mr. William Owen Jones, Chair of the Board of Directors of Hotter, Professor Emeritus Ned Pankhurst, CEO of Hotter, Mr. C Ms. Corinna Gurke, and of course, our wonderful guest speaker, Professor John Rasco AO, pioneer in gene and stem cell therapies. And thank you all also for joining us here today at Hotter for another thought-provoking conversation as part of our series, A Better Future for All. We launched last year, not in the easiest of circumstances, but we persevered. And since that time, A Better Future for All has welcomed some of Australia's most influential and inspiring individuals. And tonight's instalment, I'm sure, will be no exception. Of course, we remain immensely grateful to have award-winning journalist Kerry O'Brien in the driver's seat for this series. Kerry is a renowned bro broadcaster for almost 40 years and no stranger to anyone with even a passing knowledge of Australian journalism. He's arguably best known for his time hosting the 7.30 report in Four Corners, but as a six-time Walkley Award winner, he has a phenomenally rich and broad base of experience as a journalist, writer and interviewer. Speaking with Kerry tonight, we're privileged to welcome Professor John Rasco AO ahead of his appearance at Griffith's feature event for our Integrity 20 series in Brisbane tomorrow night, presented in partnership with A Better Future for All. Professor Rasco is a respected, decorated and pioneering clinical hematologist, pathologist and scientist with a self-professed passion for excellence in patient care and in research. He currently serves as the head of both the Gene and Stem Cell Therapy Program at the University of Sydney's Centenary Institute, as well as Cell and Molecular Therapies at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Over the course of his esteemed career, Professor Rasco has contributed to more than 150 publications on the topic of stem cells, gene transfer technologies, oncogenesis, and more, not only adding to, but fundamentally changing our understanding of human illness and recovery. In February, Professor Rasco released his new book, Flesh Made New, An Unnatural History of Broken Promises of, and Stem Cell... I'm going to try that again. Flesh Made New, The Unnatural History and Broken Promise of Stem Cells, penned with his co-author, the writer and historian, Carl, Carl Power. And you might have noticed, it is available not only from good bookshops everywhere, but also from the foyer. Published through HarperCollins ABC book imprints, Flesh Made New is a judicious examination of the history of stem cell research a field whose significant potential has often been overshadowed by a troubled and scandal-ridden past. In the book, Professor Rasco and his co-author explore both the champions and the charlatans of stem cell research, looking beyond the decades of promise and propaganda to find the genuine prospects for the field's future. Of course, the release of Flesh Made New is just the latest in a long line of career achievements for Professor Rasco. As one of the foremost minds in the field, he serves on a number of hospital, state and national bodies, including as Chair of Gene Technology Technical Advisory Committee for the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator, Chair of the Advisory Committee on Biologicals for the Therapeutic Goods Administration, Co-Founder and Past President of the Australasian Gene Therapy Society, and many more, both in Australia and globally. Given his history as a prominent and pioneering researcher, it should perhaps come as no surprise that Professor Rasco has won multiple awards for his work, including from national bodies such as the Royal College of, of uh, Pathologists of Australasia, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, and the Australian Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Last, but by no means least, in 2012, he was deservedly appointed as an officer of the Order of Australia in recognition of his service to biomedical research in the field of gene and cell therapies, as well as his experience as a clinician, author and administrator, and his long history as an executive in professional organisations and indeed as a philanthropist. 
We've got a lot to learn tonight. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So please join me in welcoming Professor Asko and Kerry O'Brien for a conversation on science, medicine, and stem cell research. Thank you, Carolyn. And um, uh, John Rasko, uh, uh, to start, I have to commend you on your choice of socks. You've, you've managed to make uh, a statement without having to open your mouth. <laughs> so, having broken the ice, as a pioneer in the application of stem cells and genetic therapies, you've come to the view that, and I'm quoting, we have reached a point in human history where we can now direct the course of our own evolution. So for somebody who is the enemy of hyperbole in your scientific field, <laughs> as you are, that's a big statement. How literally should we take that? Thanks, Kerry. Um, easy first question to kick off. Um, I think we are at a pivotal point in the grand scheme of things in terms of our technical prowess. I think most people who are attending uh, this session uh, appreciate that as a society we are obsessed with science and technology and for good reason. Uh, we bypassed many previous obsessions, uh, philosophy perhaps a couple of thousand years ago, the arts and uh, perhaps the nuclear evolution and genetics and now at a, at a phase of manipulating our very own hard wire uh, and that is our genetic information which we pass on to our children. We have now achieved technical prowess sufficient to alter the genetic material that we transmit to our offspring. That's currently illegal in this country and just about every other country in the world because of the moral, ethical and some technical uh, hurdles that that presents. But the technical ones are the least challenging, to be honest. Mm. Uh, we now have that technology available to us. And so it is a question of responsibility and appetite as to how we might go along the pathway to embracing that potentiality. And I should say, amongst the many other, other things, the roles that Carolyn uh, mentioned, I have uh, been very much in, engaged over the last couple of years in the exp expert NHMRC and, and then um, uh, government committee in terms of changing the Australian acts and policies regarding mitochondrial donation, mm. which literally does require a change in the law to allow these very rare families who suffer from a horrible genetic disease that women pass on to their children uh, and cause muscle problems, hearing problems and early death, the potential for having a family of their own and using the phrase three parent babies, yes. a third donor, a second mother if you will, to give the mitochondria, the normal mitochondria to the mother and father who give the, the primary genetic material. So Australia is embarking on a path to cross that Rubicon, to cross that uh, inheritable genetic modification barrier uh, and dividing line between altering that which we pass to our descendants. And conceptually, as human beings, you don't need to be a scientist, you can ponder what that means to be able to control our genetic destins, destiny and participate in what we contribute rather than it being a random thing or who we're attracted to or who we partner with or reproduce with. Mm. So it's real, it's here and it's now and uh, it, it is being explored in various areas of the world both uh, uh, illegally and legally because mm. you would know that China also uh, had a horrible case a few years ago when somebody did it on purpose by accident uh, and um, I think he's in jail in China at the moment. Yeah. Mm. Not hard sometimes. <laughs> but um, the, the, the loaded word for me in your quote is the word evolution, because what we understand by evolution is, is the changing, evolving nature of life itself. Yep. And so the idea that we can deliberately, consciously make decisions that are going to change the course of our evolution from here. Yep. That's the big one, isn't it? It is, and um, if, if that is daunting or threatening and causes anyone uh, concern, uh, reflect on the fact that we've been doing it uh, for very many years um, uh, to the extent in directed evolution of crops. Uh, humans have been uh, um, managing crops and directing their evolution, our pets, our, our, the little subspecies of dogs and beagles and caboodles and God knows every variation, all of those are, to some extent, directed evolution. However, the difference is that now we can intervene on purpose. 
and I reflect on the fact that people talk about different crops in Australia and the United States and elsewhere. Um, we talk about the cotton crop, for example. The technology has been around for now more than two decades to be able to introduce Roundup Ready protected crops so that now weeds can be easily uh, prevented and the crops can be much more, fer much more productive in terms of yield because the, the weeds aren't there. It's a straightforward technology and, and it's widely applied. Most people say that in America, 95% uh, of cotton is genetically modified right now and the other 5% of farmers are liars uh, because that's how widespread it is. Mm -hmm. um, we have learnt to overcome the technical barriers to do those genetic uh, changes and in doing so, mm, anticipated the possibility of doing it with other organisms and as we go up the tree back to ourselves, uh, that is a looming on the horizon possibility. Yeah. And there are so many tributaries we can go down here Indeed. on this whole thing because Indeed. it is such a huge topic and eugenics comes into it, human nature comes into it, human frailty, our capacity for mistakes, yeah. our capacity even for evil, you know, at times. But 100%. And not only that, it changes everything, Kerry, just briefly because if you make that mistake... It's not necessarily the person that you advised informed consent, look, this might cause some problems. It's their children and their children's children forever. It's the descendants of that germline now forever if you change that to the worse. And that's a grave responsibility and brings up legal questions that have never even been considered before. Yeah. Uh, what is our responsibility to future generations if we intervene? Yeah. So I'm going to try and cover as much of all of these complexities as we can. But what I want to start with is, on the face of it, a simple question. What is it about stem cells that makes them so important in all this? Well, uh, let's start with a quick definition. These are the uh, master controllers of regeneration in our bodies. Um, each of our organs have got stem cells in them. Um, the, my favourite, of course, being the blood stem cells, being a haematologist. They're responsible for changing millions of lives uh, in curing diseases like leukaemias and lymphomas and multiple myelomas uh, in the context of bone marrow transplantation. Uh, these curative technologies were developed in the 50s and 60s by Don and Dottie Thomas and a, and a group of others in Seattle where I did my postdoctoral research in the late 90s. And that's changed the world. But even in those early days in the 50s and 60s, they were not using terminology like stem cells. They were just trying to provide a treatment for leukaemias. It was only later that we understood that there are cells in various organs that are capable of regenerating and repopulating those organs when they're damaged or at rest. Right now, you and I are making 2.5 million red blood cells every second, and if we bleed badly, we might tune that up five or tenfold. Can I just say, John, I need every one of them. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome, and some generous donors may even participate in contributing from the blood bank. Um, but that said, all of our tissues have to a greater or lesser degree that level of regeneration or regenerative capacity, and it is in the stem cells, in our bone marrow that make the blood, in our hearts that regenerate cardiac tissue, even in our brain uh, that can regenerate, to some extent, brain tissue, and all of the other organs to a greater or lesser extent. Of course, then you ask the question, well, John, what's uh, the, the, the cause of those stem cells? How did they come to be? and immediately it becomes clear we have to go back to the human embryo. Mm. We have to see the lineage from where those cells came, and we can go backwards because every division of a cell is binary. Two give rise to four, eight, 16, 32, 64. So when we look back at these rare cells, the precursor cell of all of the cells in our body is the embryonic stem cell, the fertilised egg. Uh, and that is the controversial uh, cell that has uh, been mired in controversy for, since they were first conceived in humans by Jamie Thompson uh, in 1998, following a large amount of work. And then a derivative uh, concept of those uh, won the Nobel Prize with Shinya Yamanaka and Sir John Gurdon in 2012. And then along came politics. Indeed. So I'm going to come back and to religion. that. religion. I'm going to come back to that. Yeah, religion and politics, they're supposed not to mix. Uh, how far has our capacity to re-edit our genetic scaffold developed? A long way. A long way. So uh, the Nobel Prize only last year uh, to Doudna and Charpentier was this new technology called CRISPR. Uh, and uh, although th the idea of editing the genome, in other words, actually changing the sequence of the C's, A's, G's and T's in our three billion uh, bases that make up our chromosomes in all of our nucleated cells, although that idea has been around for a couple of decades and the technology, 
make no mistake, has been around for a couple of decades, it became a lot easier about 10 years ago when they did their Nobel Prize winning work. Mm. And now every student in every biology lab has the ability to genetically modify, not just by adding genes, which we've been able to do for decades, but now actually literally manipulating small sequences of the genetic information. So technically, it's no longer a big deal. So let me just say here that all these questions are coming from a definite layman. Um, uh, but but in, that, in that context, with that caveat, uh, I'm imagining, for instance, a straight line of genes. And, and let's say that you take your scissors and, you can, and, and you, can, you can now identify the gene that might cause a particular disease. Easy. You just snip it? Um, it depends if it's a disease-causing gene that you want to put something back in to correct that gene. Um, but that technology is here and now in the laboratory, not proven in the clinic yet. If we're talking about gene therapy over the last two decades, which, as you know, I've been passionate about and we've seen some great successes in diseases like haemophilia, thalassemia, uh, a few others indeed are using CAR T cells mm -hmm. for immunotherapies. Um, all of those technologies are gene addition. So we don't do any snipping per se with molecular scissors, we just plonk the new gene in and that's called gene addition technology and usually you use viruses to introduce that genetic material and bizarrely we often use the HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus which we've now tamed to uh, follow our commands, as scary as that may sound. Well hopefully that's a good thing. You've, uh, you've compared what you've called the genetic lottery to a regular lottery. Mm. So what is the genetic lottery? Well, the genetic lottery is very clear. That is uh, the fact that uh, whether we're attracted to a person for various reasons, our offspring receive the complement of uh, half and half uh, from mum and dad. And uh, to that extent, it's a lottery. Uh, you may uh, receive a complement of genes that make you intelligent, fast, smarter, uh, more beautiful, and so on, or even have red hair, perhaps, uh, when you're a young beauty, man. Beauty is a very subjective uh, term, I'm not touching that question. Uh, on the other hand, you may uh, succumb to a disease gene. And, uh, for example, in so-called monogenic disorders, uh, you know, we're talking three billion of these C's, A's, G's and T's all lined up on our chromosomes. And we're talking about 20, 25,000 genes. One of those genes, hopefully everyone in this room has a gene called factor nine, it's a clotting factor. If you're born with a single error in one of those three billion that happens to find itself in that factor nine gene, you're born with a bleeding disorder that means that you'll bleed to death Mm. Possibly at circumcision, but certainly spontaneously bleed into your knees or your ankles or your elbows all through your life, unless you replace that with clotting factor all through your life, unless someone comes along and says, I can put the gene back into your liver that you were lacking from birth and see if we can make uh, a benefit. And mm. what we're seeing right now is I've got patients five years down the track who continue not to need any factor concentrates, having required it three times a week prior to that after a single infusion. So that's here and now. That's gene addition. So is this an open field? I mean, in the sense that there are no limits to where we can go with this, from on the base, theoretically, on the basis of, of what we know. Um, I mean, what are the scientific limits to what we can reasonably hope for? In the first instance, we're really at the proof of principle stage. We want to show that we can do it safely and we require long-term studies for safety follow-up and we require larger numbers to see the variations in the way people respond. In the first instance, the proof of principle has required targeting single gene disorders, diseases like haemophilia, thalassemia, cystic fibrosis perhaps. But the big problems like cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, diabetes, Parkinson's and so on, these are multigenic disorders. They have a multitude of different genetic causations as well as environmental. And that multiplicity of causations are much more daunting. That said, if you flip the question and ask, well, how can we then treat a cancer that may have multiple genes causing it and multiple different genes in different people, mm. we can use the immune system to say, we don't care what the genetic cause is, just attack it with that particular marker. And that's where immunotherapies come in and have been shown great success in certain leukemias mm. and lymphomas. So scientific limits, what about the ethical limits now, because that word eugenics mm. will always quite rightly cast a shadow over the whole debate. It will, and uh, that's where I started uh, 
being a, a son of a Holocaust survivor, uh, having not had paternal grandparents because they were murdered in concentration camps, I uh, take it very, very seriously and, and appreciate the gravitas of the word eugenics, a word that um, I think most of us here would regard as foreign, but one only need reflect on the history of eugenics to know that there were many eugenic societies at the turn of the last century in Melbourne, various other places in Australia, embraced by politicians and scholarly luminaries. Charles Darwin's cousin, uh, Sir John Galton, uh, was one of the great founders of the word eugenics and, and developed the mathematical basis for it. So this was founded in science, but then it was corrupted uh, by those who would seek genetic purification and the views of the Nazis in genocide to eradicate that which they saw as impure, not including uh, just the Jews, but beyond that homosexuals, people of a certain political persuasion, as well as people who were regarded as genetically and intellectually defective. Yeah. And that covered a lot of ground for people who were the enemies of the Nazi party. And uh, putting, putting that worst of it to one side yes. and just, just presenting it as a, as a simple mm. notion, the simple notion that we could scientifically improve, improve the lot. Yes. And again, subjective term yeah. of every person on the planet who suffered one or other perceived afflictions. Uh, and then you can just, ju again, just as one complexity about this, people who are born with what is termed a disability mm. don't necessarily regard themselves as disabled. Absolutely. And if you're making a decision uh, with a I'm going to use the simplistic term of genetic re-editing, mm. uh, you are going to remove the possibility of somebody being born... Um, that's not an omen. Uh, oh of, somebody, of somebody uh, being born with that uh, disability. Yes. Um, there would be people with disabilities who would say, my life is rich. Indeed, uh, and that opens up a whole complex question uh, in terms of the real definition of eugenics, which means by good birth or by, 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 uh, by uh, good development. Uh, and uh, um, uh, truly, who would not want the best for their offspring? Not only a lack of disease, but also why not uh, have uh, some of the features that many of us would regard as attractive, be they beauty, intelligence, uh, athletic prowess, or so on. The challenge here has been encapsulated by that film Gattaca, which I think many people are aware of, wherein um, uh, the world had become uh, a place where there was an obligation to participate and avoid the genetic lottery and have genetic certainty. And that, of course, uh, uh, afforded uh, some with an attractive uh, uh, end, but uh, in, in, in clearly ethically raised the biggest questions. And, and indeed, the coda to Gattaca, which many people didn't see because it was cut out of the final release, mm. uh, said, you know, the kind of people that would no longer have existed in a world uh, of Gattaca include Stephen Hawking, uh, of course, had uh, muscular, uh, muscular dystrophies yes. and uh, so many others who suffered from genetic diseases um, that perhaps um, meant that the world would have been less a richer place had we eradicated those genetic abnormalities, you know, by doing a routine eugenics activity. So I think it raises questions even of hubris and uh, um, uh, an absolute arrogance that humanity is often guilty of, and back to the Nazi party, yeah. I mean, the goal originally was built on ideas that were developed in the United States of America. And some of those ideas that then followed on from the UK, they, they were developed actively in many, many cases where people were put into uh, places where they, they were not allowed to reproduce. Australia had an active policy of non-reproduction and they absolutely uh, uh, caused some people who were regarded as not being capable of, uh, worthy of reproducing, uh, they, they were um, made un infertile. Uh, so we are not guiltless and we are guilty of that hubris that uh, I think mm. you're referring to. And nonetheless, the idea that one day we may improve the genetic lot of humanity is a compelling one. And I think we have to learn to crawl before we walk, before we run fast. And I think that's the crucial point. If we take a cautious step and treat diseases rather than enhancement, which is that dichotomy and where you're pushing me towards, but I won't cross it, I'll say, let's 
see if the first steps can allow us to treat disease, clear disease-causing genes like mitochondrial diseases mm. or haemophilia, and maybe one day in the decades to come, yes, prevent the genetic propagation of the haemophilia gene. Yeah, I, I, I'm perhaps up for that under the right circumstances in the future. But the idea that you want to make everyone a redhead, I'll, I'll step back and... and, and it's not uh, bad. Uh, <laughs> what... Um... Explain, you, you mentioned briefly before the three-parent family. Explain the three-parent family and the moral dilemma that that throws up. Yeah, we, we don't like that phrase, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, I don't want to provoke any, any confusion. But here we have um, an interesting challenge. Um, there are some 40 or so genes carried in what are regarded as the batteries of all of our cells, the mitochondria. And interestingly, the mitochondria are only transmitted through the maternal uh, line. Uh, men's mitochondria cease uh, at, at their life. The mitochondria only go through from mother to daughter and so right. on. And so uh, mitochondrial myopathy or mitochondrial diseases are only transmitted uh, through the maternal lineage. The idea is if a woman finds that her offspring have suffered uh, with mitochondrial disease, and we're talking about perhaps five, ten families a year at most in Australia. It's a very, very rare disease. She clearly would love to be able to reproduce, and if given the alternative, she would like to reproduce biologically. There are many alternatives for which she needs to be counselled, um, including adoption and non-reproduction and so on, and all of those need to be discussed as part of informed consent. But be that as it may, um, there is now a technical possibility which was first explored uh, in the United Kingdom by the Warnock Commission, and it's now approved and under trial in the, in, in the UK and being explored in the USA and other countries. But the Warnock Commission spent 10 years considering the ethics of embarking on this. Mm. In, in, I think uh, a few years ago now, uh, it approved, that the, the Parliament of the UK approved that this could go ahead, and indeed a number of babies have been born using this three-parent baby technology. And it is the idea that... Uh, the mother and the father, the biological mother and who carries the mitochondrial disease and the father uh, have in vitro fertilisation, so now they have a fertilised egg. The nucleus of that egg is removed, which is possible to do these days quite routinely, and shoved into a third party uh, egg which has had its own nucleus removed. And believe it or not, it can work. It works in animal models and it can work in humans. And that egg can then be implanted in the biological mother's uterus and come to term, and that baby can be born with the nuclear genetic material from mum and dad and the mitochondrial DNA from the third party, which hopefully will correct that disease. But the big key now is that child's mitochondria will be from a third party, and that child's daughter will also carry the third party mitochondria. Now, some have said, oh, look, it's really not to worry about because it's just a battery. It's only just powering the cell. Let's not worry. You can get your copper tops and your Everettis and God knows and just plug it back in. It's really not because we know that there are some of these mitochondrial disease, sorry, mitochondrial genes that are normally present in all of our cells and all of our mitochondria that, for example, uh, are, are, can determine sports prowess. Some uh, Olympic athletes have a specific type of mitochondrial gene, so-called haplotype, that, that we recognise as being linked to their, si their sporting prowess. So, so at some point you might be going into the marketplace, you know, as a parent, you might want to go into the marketplace and uh, try and Give me and those find... Olympic mitochondria. Yes, yes. Absolutely. So, so we are crossing a dividing line by embarking on this, what on the surface is a very straightforward hey, let's help these families. It's not going to be cheap, but this sounds like a good idea. And indeed, uh, the Parliament has now had a second reading. Minister Hunt, it's called Maeve's Law. It was read into the Parliament at the last sitting uh, for the second time. And there's every, it will be uh, one of the first um, conscience votes, actually, uh, that the Parliament will have considered in some years, uh, uh, very soon. But that said, um, the idea that um, uh, we will be doing this does provoke real questions about inheritable genetic material because once we do it, the offspring will, there's no, no, no way around it, the offspring will carry the mitochondria and the DNA of the mitochondria from a third party donor. Yes, and, and, and as you're sitting here, and I'm, and I'm marvelling at what you're describing, but I'm also thinking 
the, the sort of the ingenuity of the discovery of that process, mm. that technological process, and what it has led to, what it has allowed. And I'm sitting here thinking, what is the next level of ingenuity down that road and the next one after that? And that, to me, is the real extraordinary element of this whole discussion. We don't know where this can end up. We just don't know. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it can lead to amazing things, but we just don't know. Um, what did we learn from how the Human Genome Project was developed, going from public ownership to commercial and so on? What, what have we learned from that whole project? Well, I must say, back in the day, uh, and we're talking about the late 90s, when there was a, in a... You will recall this, perhaps like yesterday, Kerry, when there was a public-private fight to see who would be first. Mm. Uh, Francis Collins, on the one hand, from the National Institutes of Health and the Government of the United States of America represented, and uh, his opposition in industry, uh, who was flamboyant and, and, and uh, uh, did things by uh, industrial grunt and might and, and uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, degree of, um, yeah, demonstration of what money can do. Mm. Francis Collins had a very measured, careful, methodologically sound approach uh, and his opposition uh, came in and very actively said, no, 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 we're going to do a brute force and ignorance approach. We're going to sequence everything and just kind of sew it all together at the end. Both approaches required one another to some extent, um, but it raised questions of ownership of genetic material yeah. and that then raised questions of who owns the information, that, in particular genes like the BRCA1 gene predisposing individuals to cancer, uh, and uh, whether we screen for that and whether that's a test that we should be paying for or should be publicly available. It also led to questions, I think, that um, really caused one to reflect on um, how industry can drive discovery and force what would be a more, not complacent, but more steady and methodologically sound approach to go faster and go harder because it really was Craig Venter versus Francis Collins and they were both on the cover of Time magazine when the Human Genome Project was announced by Bill Clinton and he described it in biblical terms. Of course he would. He, he would. Um, I think Hillary was laughing in the background but uh, uh, perhaps that was, Monica was probably there too. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't recall the details but um, something with a blue dress. Um, uh, in any case, uh, at, the, at the time... A bit of science involved in that. Yeah, too, yeah there was, was. It's complicated. But there was DNA involved, I understand. Yes, yes. that's right. Um, uh, um, so to the extent... You are, you are surprising me. <laughs> to the extent that um, it changed the world, I was sceptical because it was a hell of a lot of money at the time. And I was a little resentful at the diversion of funds to something that seemed to me to be an academically interesting pursuit that would give us the human genome in all its glory and the sequencing. It was announced, and about two or three years later, we actually got the real, the real details, but there it was. We got the bare bones, and the, the big announcement with Bill and colleagues. Uh, and um, I think on reflection, I was wrong um, because the benefits of that have, like stem cells, like gene therapy, and like so many human discoveries, taken dec decades to realise. But please make no mistake, I was wrong, and the benefits of that human genome project have driven revolutionary changes in medicine, in diagnosis, in prognosis. Genetic medicine is a technology that allows us to categorise disease, to give much more refined prognostications about any different diseases, cancer in particular, choosing rare drugs that might work uh, can be, imp mm. can be uh, uh, you know, cr d discovered through using genetic information, and not only uh, diagnosis but also uh, the, the prognostication, whether you've got a good version of the disease or a bad version of the disease. All of those things come into genetics, but it's not a therapeutic Avenue that then leads to gene therapy, where we use the genetic information of a disease and say, why don't we put back the normal version of a, a disease gene, uh, put the normal version to create a benefit? Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think the Human Genome Project has contributed incredibly to driving discovery, 
helping us understand disease causation in much finer detail than we previously did and offering us new targets uh, for, for the clever uh, pharmaceutical industry to be able to um, uh, really drive information technology. It is a revolution. It is still ongoing and it's taken a lot longer and it will take a lot longer to fund fully so that ultimately we will all have our, our genetic sequence available to us, I'm sure. Of course, one of the aspects of all of this, it's always, you know, it's always a part of just about any equation and, and that is the issue of, uh, we're, we're talking cost and equity. Mm. I mean, the cost can be huge yeah. for therapies. Um, we've seen the shocking inequity in how COVID-19 vaccines are being distributed around the world or not. I yep. mean, it is uh, offensive, in a sense, to watch the way it has unfolded, that we, the, with the privilege of wealth, are able to access it in a way that countries with little or no wealth are essentially being ignored. Um, and the medicine, as I say, that we're talking about, the, the future, now and the future, could be hugely expensive. Is it a real possibility that we'll see those with the money and the privilege genetically re-editing their offspring to the extent that they might be taller, they might be more athletic, they might be more attractive, looking, looking by traditional standards, he said carefully, <laughs> um, less prone to suffer genetic disease, that that might be confined, not confined completely, but substantially to those with the money? I think the answer is inevitably yes, there is a strong risk of that happening. Um, it won't be government sanctioned, to the best of my understanding, and it won't be done explicitly, um, but it will be offered uh, in centres that are free from government supervision. So it's not out of the question for people to fly to places uh, that are not uh, widely uh, recognised uh, and necessarily under the direct supervision of our regulatory authorities that would um, insist. Mm that those things not be undertaken. But one, when one reflects on what money can buy and what money can do and the temptation to intervene and avoid the genetic lottery, it seems to me that that is going to be too attractive for some to avoid. Hmm. So we go all the way back to the Hippocratic Oath and, um, and this is almost the opposite in a sense, isn't it? I mean, we are... Um, how, how do you head that off at the pass? How do you head that? How do you, how do you legislate for equity in this mm. field? How, how does the medical profession? What part does the medical profession play in trying to forestall a circumstance? And I'm, you know, let's not go down the path of talking about a super race. That would be a gross extreme. Uh, but, but if we are talking about the enhancement of life, mm. and that the path to the enhancement of life is much more available. Uh, for those with the money than the rest. That surely, you have to move heaven and earth to prevent, pre prevent that if you can, don't you? You would think. Um, so that uh, inequity is something we must all reflect on fundamentally because we are in a privileged part of the world. Um, that said, um, stem cells and gene therapy uh, partners uh, together in, in, in future health and future medicine uh, offer a poss possibility for uh, what I think most would agree is a better world if it, if it reduces disease and suffering and harm. That said, it has a flip side. And uh, that's no more uh, better revealed than in the case of the unproven stem cell clinics that spread all over the world and that we spent some considerable time a few years ago documenting. These are clinics that we thought uh, perhaps were... Um, you know, in the Ukraine or uh, in the Philippines or uh, some parts of Southeast Asia. And when we actually went online and we documented myth mythologically sound way looking at direct-to-consumer marketing of stem cells, we found that they were all over the world. There were more clinics in the United States of America than any other country in the world. But the country with the highest per capita direct-to-consumer marketing of stem cells was down under. And indeed, uh, perhaps that's because we have a low, uh, a low population and, and uh, high medical services. But it took the, the Therapeutics Goods Administration many years of people like me and others lobbying uh, them to say there is a loophole that is allowing these clinics to continue. And people don't need to flock to the Ukraine or, or the Philippines or somewhere else. They can flock to their local supermarket and be offered stem cells from the belly for whatever it is that ails you. And these are unproven and untested and may uh, cost you $10,000 for the fun of it. And, and the key uh, was um, when the FDA commissioner at the time was asked, 
exactly the question you just put, namely, how do we stop this big problem? And his answer informed me so much. He said, you can't boil the ocean. You can't boil the ocean. By which he meant, this is such a bloody big problem that no one country can control it. So that's That doesn't why, mean you sit on your hands. So that's it? why uh, people like myself have gone to the World Health Organization through the International Society for Cell and Gene Therapy, which I was president of uh, for the last couple of years, and lobbied them, as well as places like Google, to say, hey, Google, you shouldn't be advertising these stem cell mm. clinics online. And they took that up in a ridiculously fun way, which tells you a lot of a story about the hype and hope of stem cells. Google basically said, you know what? After about a year of lobbying them, they said, you know what? You're right. We're going to ban these stem cell clinics. We're going to hit them at the, you know, they can't advertise on Google anymore. It's, this is a win for everyone sane, everyone who embraces rational medicine, no more unproven cell, stem cell therapies. Of course, what they did was also inadvertently ban all of the bone marrow transplant centres of excellence in all of the hospitals all over the world that had their medical centres online because they hadn't appreciated that there are unproven stem cells and proven stem cells that have won Nobel Prizes. And so, excuse me, Mr Google, a um, little bit of a mistake there. Could you please back off a little bit? But the answer to your question at the key is how do we do it? We do it by meetings like this. We do it by raising awareness. We do it by educating an already interested population in science and technology, partly because of COVID. It's never been a better time to talk about science and medicine. But to simply say, not everything is, is as good as it seems and there's no such thing as a free lunch. Mm. And, you know, uh, you need to be mindful that every discovery that you hear is not necessarily a cure for cancer or whatever it is that ails you. Yeah. And there are some sources of reputable information uh, and there are others that you need to verify independently and always take care and always seek independent advice. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there are, there are two strands to what, you've what you're touching on here. One, one is probably misrepresentation yep. of false claims mm -hmm. or unsubstantiated claims and a lot of money turning over on the basis of that. And mm -hmm. then there's outright fraud yes. as being a part of the history. So, and I associate fraud with criminality. Yes. Looking back now at the depth of actual fraud and misrepresentation on genetic therapy and stem cells that you've chronicled in your book, has it shocked you to contemplate the extent to which reputable people in science and medicine were prepared to throw their ethics out the window? Of course it has. Yes, it has. It's a profoundly disappointing uh, experience to reflect on especially people who you believe are leading the field, publishing in the best journals, to find that they have cooked the books and, and actively deceived um, the medical establishment and everybody reading the work, the amount of wasted time and effort, not just funding of public monies that are thrown down the toilet because it's garbage, that they, they just cooked the books, they've just manipulated an image or lied about a result. And sometimes it takes months or years to identify these deceits. Uh, and in the most egregious example, people die as a consequence of this misrepresentation. And then, then in your broader body of research, you have to backtrack. Indeed, yeah. and, and, untie the, the misrepresentation. Is there any truth in any of this, for example? But just to correct you a little bit, Kerry, uh, uh, the book is about stem cells and not really yeah, about genetic. Course. So yeah. ge I don't think there's that much fraud. There's been some pretty sad examples of financial impropriety in the gene therapy field and the death of Jesse Gelsinger, which sent shockwaves in the genetic therapy area some 20 years mm. ago, uh, was, was certainly an example of that. But, you know, almost as a lover on the rebound, when gene therapy seemed to fail about 20 years ago because of a death uh, in, in the field, we found stem cells as the redemption, and it's been the case ever since. Now, we set out, first of all, to talk about the promise and hope of stem cells. That was, our, that was our goal 10 years ago when we wrote a grant to a brochure, the Brochure Foundation and said, we'd like to write a book. Could you please fund us to have a lovely holiday, I mean, research trip uh, in, on the sh sh shores of Lake Geneva, which uh, Carl and I enjoyed immensely. But that led us then to get deeper and deeper into the history. And, you know, I've been involved in this for decades. And we began unpicking the promise, the triumphs, the successes and the champions and reflected on the fact that there was an equal amount of hype and overhype 
as well as downright fraud. And then the analyses that have been done in terms of academic publications show that stem cell research is overrepresented in an objective measure of scientific fraud, which is the retraction of scientific papers. So we can measure that. And the fact of the matter is, compared to other like scientific and medical disciplines, stem cells are pretty bad and on the nose when it comes to retractions. And so we know that there is something about this that is promoting um, uh, people who would otherwise compromise their ethics and, and who, who are driven down to, to either fraudulently misrepresent their data or indeed downright lie. And that is the real challenge. That's the shock. And we've seen it in every country. We, we documented it all the way along from Hwang Guk Su in Korea. Yes, I was uh, going to, this is, this is the question. Who are the, who have been the significant villains? These are our uh, sinners. Uh, we have a patron saint uh, which is Alexis Carroll, uh, that we described from 100 years ago, a Nobel Prize winner. It was who, both good and bad. Indeed, he is our patron saint and patron sinner. And uh, we call him in the prehistory of stem cells because he taught the world how to grow cells outside of the body. An extraordinary discovery um, that was, would have been equal in, in stature to the one that he no, won the Nobel Prize for, which was joining blood vessels together. He was a surgeon. Um, but he also um, inflicted a horrible hoax on humanity and on science for decades. He was the one who had the uh, scientific equivalent of the blob. Um, namely, he took a chicken heart, an embryonic chicken heart, beating cells, put them into a dish, and he grew them in that dish that he claimed was the same that was able to be nurtured and grown in his special lab at the Rockefeller Institute for decades. And we now know that, of course, that's impossible, but we only learnt that after probably dozens if not hundreds of scientists tried to replicate his data and failed. And so we do have checks and measures and balances in science and it is replication, replication and replication. If one lab is saying I can do it and no one else is saying we can do it too, that's got to uh, trigger alarm bells. But Alexis Carroll being the grand priest and high priest of de developing tissue culture, every year the press would come and sing happy birthday to these cells, even though we know that they must have been either repopulated from another uh, chicken heart or there was a virus or they transformed into cancer. But nonetheless, it took 30 years and another uh, quite uh, dogmatic scientist to say, you know what, this is bull and it's not working and it's not true and I can't reproduce this because he invented the concept, his name was Leonard Hayflick, he invented the concept of cellular senescence, which we now know to be true for all cell types mm. in, our, in our body. We can't grow them after a certain number of cell divisions unless they become cancerous or infected by viruses. So he is our patron saint. He made incredible contributions, and whether inadvertently or by poor technique, or whether his research assistants were cooking the books, we'll never know, because he passed away before uh, this actually came to the fore. But he then started a tradition of stem cell fraudsters, if you will, Huang Wu Suk uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, modern times, uh, claimed to be able to, uh, in South Korea, create clones uh, using a somatic nuclear transfer in 2004 was his work. Uh, you remember South, uh, South Korea was famous for the Raelians who claimed that they were cloning people all over the world, uh, which was a marvellous religious bunk. But nonetheless, uh, Hwang Woo Suk was a vet and he was, he was uh, truly the first person on the planet to clone a dog. Uh, interestingly, there is a tradition in naming uh, these uh, cloned animals uh, after famous people. And you know, Dolly mm. uh, was named uh, famously after um, certain cells that were taken from uh, a sheep's uh, breast. Um, and you may know someone called Dolly uh, who has uh, 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 equivalent fame. Got that. Snuppy, Snuppy was Huang Wu Suk's dog, and that was a particularly clever name for a dog because Snuppy uh, was S N U P P Y, and that was Seoul National University puppy. Snuppy, and the first cloned dog. Long story short, Huang Wu Suk, he cooked his books without a doubt, and he was, he was entitled the supreme scientist of South Korea face on the stamps, given every accolade in South Korea, and then uh, an investigative journalist and series of uh, exposés pulled him down over a long period of time. It was a dogged fight. But in the end, um, he then retreated 
and became famous for uh, starting a company which still exists today that Barbara Streisand has cloned her dogs. You can send uh, your dead dog cell samples to South Korea and have your dog cloned and she's got two lovely dogs uh, that she, she adores. Mm. Hwang Woo Suk was a fraudster, but he was only one. And then the next one was probably Pierre Anversa from the United States of America, who claimed he discovered stem cells in the heart. Uh, then Haruko Obakata from Japan, who claimed that you could just dip cells in the equivalent of a slightly acid solution, acid like a, like a Coca-Cola, and reprogram them to become stem cells. And she was called out very early on after her back-to-back -back, uh, nature papers, um, but she collaborated with people in Boston who still haven't been held to account and were allowed to retire early. But the worst I've left to last, of, cur of course, and that is the infamous uh, windpipe surgeon and very handsome, handsome celebrity surgeon by the name of Piero Maccarini, uh, and, uh, sorry, Paolo Maccarini. And Paolo Maccarini was uh, famously trained in Europe. He was headhunted by the home of the Nobel Prizes, the, the Karolinska Institute, to join them mm. because he claimed he was able to take a, a, a decellularized windpipe, the, 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 that, that which allows us to breathe, and uh, replace it in individuals by populating that windpipe with bone marrow stem cells. And indeed, virtually all, but not all, of his papers have subsequently been retracted. Uh, there were investigations uh, by, uh, 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 prompted by many whistleblowers at the time who said this can't be right, um, but they were pushed down, they lost their jobs and they lost their grants as a consequence. Um, forgive me, Vice Chancellor, but even the Vice Chancellor of the Karolinska Institute was, was, was uh, caught up in this and lost her job. The shockwaves that destroyed many careers at the Karolinska Institute were firmly on uh, Macarini's shoulders, but worst of all, um, lives, lives. most of his patients died a horrible death, strangulation, in to you know, basically unable to breathe because of his fraudulent data. And so was this, was this all part of the boiling ocean, that you can't boil an ocean in terms of regulation? I don't that these think things so. Were, that these things just escaped for a time? I think this was an appetite for fame in, this, in the place which, you know, really promulgates that greatest... So how do you guard against that? Isn't that what, what peer review at the most fundamental level is supposed to be about? Yes, sir, it is. But ultimately you can't... You can't, unless you can prove it, prove a lie. If, if I'm determined to tell you that the... Well, you can with Donald Trump. Well, well <laughs> let's not go there. And a few others. I was going to use other examples, but, mm. you know, I can tell you that the colour of my wallet is black now, and you can't prove it unless you, you somehow obtain it. Yeah. Um, so I can walk out of here and, and, and you, can, you believe what you like, but I can claim it. In the same way, if I give you a straight-faced lie, and I know that you can't prove it otherwise, then there's no way of disproving it until but somebody do, but else... But do you know, don't you know, as the scientist, that at some point someone's going to get you? Someone's going someone's to prove it? You know, that is a question that I have pondered with Carl and we wrote it in our Guardian article and the article was basically entitled What Prompts a Scientist to Lie? Because it cuts to the core, Kerry, of what... I would hope that most people respect biomedical scientists, respect medicos, and give them the authority and, 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 and respect that they deserve. But these are examples that call into question that assumption. And what causes a scientist to lie is what my friend and colleague Glenn Begley has called perverse incentives, those incentives to publish or perish, those incentives to get grants and prove yourself smarter and better than your competitors. Even though five years down the track... You may get caught, but you don't see it. It's the same reason why kids steal something in the candy store and, and you know, might, might get caught and punished as a consequence. It was but, there, but kids, I wanted but it... kids aren't reputable scientists who've gone through a lifetime developing their discipline and all of the, all of the things that go with that discipline. Yeah. And how old did you say Donald Trump was? <laughs> yes. He's a special. Mm. In, and, and speaking of Donald, in the age of fake news, there has been a huge assault on the science of climate change, and the flames have been very effectively fanned by Donald Trump, not just in America. What has that done to public trust in science generally, including in your field, the, the, the sort of fake news aspect to all of this, where in climate change you can have 99% of the world's climate scientists yep. 
stating positions or a position, a, a, um, an agreed position, uh, but somehow or other the 1% is parlayed into a significant um, erosion of trust in the other 99. I think you probably know more about this than I, uh, having sat on one side of that divide, um, but it is about twisting the ear of those people who would listen. And certainly from the Australian perspective, I think it's fair to say that we've observed an America divided. But um, yeah, but what, what, I'm, uh, what I'm asking you is, as a scientist yourself, yep. what does, what, uh, it must raise concerns to you that if, some, if, if established science from the most reputable person in the field uh, can have the ground significantly cut from under it yep. at, um, by specious argument. Mm. If it can happen with climate science, it can happen with any science. That's correct. Do you think there has been an impact on the credibility of science generally, including in your own field, that, that, that there is a there is this kind of spreading stain effect of this, that it's not just confined to one field of science. Well, I think raising questions is, is, is reasonable, and I think put two scientists in a room together and you certainly get three opinions. Um, but not as many said, as you get with two economists. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that said, you, 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 you forced me to uh, uh, you know, address a question about public perception. And uh, with COVID, I think our trust in what science is capable of doing in a miraculous time frame has been reinforced. Um, that is a source that we should be all rejoicing and celebrating in terms of our safety and well-being. We're not wearing masks. Um, and that's because of public health. And I reflect on the fact that five years ago, most people in Australia had no idea what a public health physician did, mm. uh, let alone the details of all of the different things that we've learned over the last 18 yeah, months. But, but imagine, uh, when, when you look at, and California was your kind of sort of number one example of all of these unproven therapies mm -hmm. that are out there being flogged on the internet and, and where, wherever they can be flogged. Yep. But the internet is there, isn't it, as a kind of, as a, as, Echo uh, as a device like we have never had before mm. in terms of global communication and global miscommunication. So just put that, just think about that in the context of the path and paths that you are headed down with your science mm. and the extraordinary areas we are heading towards, including the ethical, the, the really important ethical issues that relate to that, put that against fake news. Yeah. Put that against what the internet is capable of doing as a twisting force. Yes. That surely is a matter of enormous concern. It is. So, so now to answer the, the clar with clarity, um, uh, the, the amplification of extreme views is something that the internet has been an unexpected mediator of. It has democratised individual voices in a way that we wouldn't have anticipated, but also it has perverted uh, many voices by corralling them in more extreme views and forcing them into communities that are sometimes would otherwise have been socially unacceptable or completely uh, outlawed. Mm. So to the extent that I'm convinced that any new discovery that can be monetized by people who will falsely claim to already have it here and now, that is the sound and the caution that Flesh Made New seeks most to raise. If you go away after reading that book uh, a little bit disillusioned, perhaps a little bit worried, we've done our job. We don't wish... I'd say more than a little bit. Well, we don't wish to say there is... Uh, not promised there's been great success and there continues to be, but the idea of regenerating tissues, which is what stem cells claimed they would bring to us very soon uh, after 1998, have not been realised yet and they may, it may still be decades away. That said, there have been people claiming to be able to regenerate organs and tissues for not decades, but between 50 and 100 years. Fresh cell therapy was available in the 1930s and we had, you know, Politicians, Mahatma Gandhi, Pica Pablo Picasso, great artists and, 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 and everybody else flocking to the shores of Lake Geneva to get their fetal cells from cows and sheep to regenerate their tissues. So the idea that you could you know, pick on the well of immortality and regenerate tissues has been there. It's been a fundamental desire. And so people have preyed on that desire. 
If somebody tells you with a serious disease or a family member with a serious disease that they have the treatment and the reason why no one else is offering it is because they don't understand or because I've developed something extra special, just give me 20,000 bucks and I'll give it to you at, at a special price, um, that is extremely attractive. And it's, a, it's just a variation, isn't it, of, remember Steve McQueen, famous actor, um, diagnosed with, uh, with a form of cancer that was almost certainly going to kill him. He's tried everything, it hasn't worked. So he nicks across the border into Mexico to, to go for the, I think it was uh, the apricot kernel treatment. Mm -hmm. It's a funny twist on, on an extraordinary story because I made brief mention earlier on of the film called The Blob. Uh, did you know that Steve McQueen was the he star was. of The That's Blob? Right. That's uh, entirely coincidental. I've indeed, that. indeed. But what a beautiful segue. Um, so um, uh, Steve McQueen, um, uh, what a famous a actor he was. The temptation to uh, succumb to false hope is that which I w would rail against. And I hate the concept that I might be up here paternalistic or condescending in the way of saying, well, don't do it because I'm telling you not to do it. But all I'm saying is reflect on the evidence and seek alternative advice. If you think something is too good to be true, it probably is, namely mm. too good to be true. Yeah. Uh, and that's the lesson that we wish to uh, highlight. And whether it be through outright fraud or misrepresentation or just outright lies, um, we know that there are many, many people who would prey on the unsuspecting public. There are many expensive homeopathies, if you will, none of which work, including homeopathy. Sorry. Well, I'm not going to go there now <laughs> with, with four minutes to go. Sponsored there's by... Just, <laughs> there's just a couple of uh, things quickly that I want to pass by uh, before we finish. And one is uh, with Joe Biden, we are now back in America, back in the field of, uh, of embryonic stem cell, of embryonic uh, stem cell use um, in, in research. Where are you on that? And do you respect those who have a genuine moral or religious objection to the use of human embryos? I do. And I believe that our proudest moment in the book uh, is discussing without fear or favour the true scientific uh, basis for where that profound, extreme divide exists. And it exists in a question that science can't resolve, and that's why it is such an important question, which is when does life begin? And more importantly, when does, does personhood begin? And science has allowed us to uh, Im impact on that question very, very clearly. Um, you know, the Vatican, uh, which has driven a lot of the ethical questions and religious uh, dogma in this issue, changed its view on when life begins. It was originally taught by the Vatican that, um, uh, that it was when an egg became fertilised, when a sperm meets an ovum. But they learnt, uh, and uh, the, the Pope announced in uh, the, the gift of life, I think, was his, his, his papal encyclically, that um, uh, in fact science had learnt that it wasn't when the sperm actually penetrated the egg itself, it was when their genetic material intertwined the sperm and, and, the, and, the, and the eggs, and that took 22 hours. So the Vatican, to their good credit and respect, said, nah, -uh, it's not when the sperm meets the egg, it's actually 22 hours later, and that's when life begins. That is conception, that is a new life, and we will afford that new life the respect that you and I and everybody else in this room has. Equivalence, equivalence of a single cell to, a, um, an, an, let's say, an adult human or a person. And that has been debated forever uh, uh, by humans. When does personhood occur? Different religions define it differently. There was a time... But, but in the science, in the science, when do you believe um, it is OK, ethical, to use a human embryo? Well, currently, uh, there is a law uh, in Australia and uh, we are allowed to do it for a certain number of days. We are allowed to study human embryos for a certain number of dis days before they uh, must be destroyed. Um, we uh, certainly have legislation that allows us to um, uh, have uh, in vitro fertilisation uh, occurring. There are different laws in different countries. Uh, and uh, those boundaries are slowly uh, being pushed by, uh, by people who would uh, study things further, and I think legitimately so, because mm. they will impact on human health and allow us to understand 
not, not just basic biology for academic reasons, but indeed fertility and study how we can help families uh, and, and, and understand um, how uh, some of those technologies can be better applied. But that said, um, the definition of um, uh, personhood is a cultural one, a religious one, a moral one, and an ethical one, and really science has less to do with that. I mean, it's almost arbitrary that the 14 days when the, the notochord, when we get a, a primitive neurological system, that's what the arbitrary definition currently is. Well, when the, when the primitive streak occurs, uh, uh, that's when we say, well, beyond that, it's, not, it's a no-go. Hmm. But that sounds almost more arbitrary than the Vatican position, which seems to be reasonably logical. So far be it from me to, to be uh, defending uh, certain positions, but I do think that these are questions that are... Uh, um, uh, reasonable, and the different positions can be reasonably held. You asked me whether yes. I respect... I do respect the proposition that an alternative view can be held, but in the end, we need to make decisions as, as a society, and thankfully, that's what politicians do. So, in this discussion, we're about to come full circle. Uh, so, in a clear-headed way, and not that everything you've said hasn't been clear-headed, <laughs> what do you actually feel positive about in terms of where the science is headed. Absolutely. So proven stem cells, bone marrow trans transplantation. Over two million bone marrow transplants on the planet since Don Thomas first started, cured many leukaemias, lymphomas, myelomas, and other cancers. Done, dusted, fantastic, getting better all the time. Proven stem cells work, thank you very much. Right now, instead of promising in the distant future regenerative medicine, which we all hope for, to be able to grow organs outside of the body, regenerate tissues so that we have off-the-shelf ability to transplant organs and, and repair organs. Right here and now, we have technologies based on the Nobel Prize winning work of Shinya Yamanaka in Japan that allow us essentially to create fertilised egg cells or embryonic stem cell-like cells from every cell in our body. So now we can take a blood sample from anyone we can create essentially pluripotent cells that if ultimately implanted into a womb and carried to term would create your clone, would create your clone. Those cells, that's illegal, please don't do it. <laughs> Those cells would also, be, because they are capable of giving rise to every cell in your body, can be coaxed down those pathways to create, in a dish, liver cells, brain cells, bone marrow cells, heart cells, and those dishes then contain a gen the same genetic material from the donor, and that can be a rare disease, maybe only 100 on the planet. There are four, five, 6,000 genetic diseases. Only 5% of them have possible treatments at the moment. Wow. We can study those diseases in a dish and use the might of industrial screening. We can take a rare genetic disease now and test 100,000 drugs on them in a period of a week. That why is that a big deal? It's not regenerative medicine, but it's here and now, and the pharmaceutical industry is using it every day. They were using mini organoids, these mini organs, not mini me, illegal, but mini organs, to recapitulate organ development and testing drugs that might cause side effects on heart tissue, testing benefits on screening on cancer cells or, or indeed normal cells to see whether or not some benefits. That's here and now and it's being used and of course it's being used in all aspects of technology including producing COVID vaccines and so on. Lung tissue in a dish. Imagine what that technology can afford us and it's here now and being used and has been for quite a few years now based on that Nobel Prize winning work. That inspires me. That is here and now and it's real. And so that's what stem cells have offered us here and now. Proven 50 years ago before we even knew what stem cells were in bone marrow transplants and induced pluripotent stem cells or reprogrammed stem cells from the Nobel Prize winning work of Yamanaka that is here and now and maybe in decades to come cells that can give rise to organs for transplantation and cure diseases that currently have unmet medical needs. John Rasko, great conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Karina Gerke. I'm the CEO here at Hotter Home of the Arts, and it's my very great pleasure to give the vote of thanks tonight. Kerry, thank you as always for an extremely interesting conversation and asking both the big 
and the important questions. John, we didn't have the pleasure of meeting before this session. Uh, I do love your socks as well. <laughs> um, and I will confess that doing the vote of thanks tonight, I was completely out of my comfort zone, <laughs> right? So I'm the arts girl and I do actually have a chair of the board that's a scientist. So I begged Ned, I said, I think you're probably better equipped. And he said, no, absolutely not. Up you go, CEO. And so I'm just going to give a few of my highlights from this discussion. You started with saying you're going to... No, humans have bypassed arts and philosophy. Did I? You did, John. I think our Kerry was said that. No, I, I'm on to you. So, and I thought, oh, here we go. I'm in for an interesting conversation because arts and philosophy is everything that I am. Then we seem to move on to, and I loved this, is arts, mitochondria and thing? Because you spoke about sports and I was thinking, so wouldn't mm. that be fascinating if arts actually was that and yes. then artists ruled the world? Then I got sidetracked somewhere in the blob and Steve McQueen. Mm. And then I was thinking, oh, ho hold on, what is this about Barbara Streisand and her dogs and science? And then I remembered that I was fearful of this conversation because of the philosophical questions, the ethical questions around stem cell research and what that actually meant to humans. And where I landed at the end of this conversation was that I had a much deeper understanding of the science, of the thoughtfulness behind it, and you left me with a sense of optimism that the future of this research and this technology and this science is in good hands because you were incredibly cautious and optimistic. And at the end of the day, we shared a lot of similarities in that both of us, I think our currency is humanity and humans and working towards a deeper understanding of humans and their well-being. Yeah. So I'm very grateful for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to invite everyone to our next conversation, which is on the 27th of May with Walkley Award-winning journalist Jess Hill, who's been reporting on domestic abuse since 2014. And that too is an issue that is very close to our hearts, particularly here on the Gold Coast at the moment. So please do join that conversation. The other thing that I need to say is that you're signing books oh. out in the foyer. So I really encourage you to go to buy that book, also available in all good bookstores, to have further conversations with John, have a drink and enjoy the chat that you can have after this great provocation. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you again. Jeez. Good evening. Thank you.